Okay, guys. So I grew up in a house where my dad liked to embellish his stories like a lot. Um, he always had kind of a bold and wild claim to all of them. And as a little kid, I would all of them because my dad doesn't lie to me. It's all true. Um, I believed every single word. And then as I got older and the stories got bigger, um, you kind of had to start putting a question mark on a lot of those details, on most of those details. Um, and when you hear a story, as you're, you know, I have littles, I can tell them many, believe me, the power of parenting. Um, but, you know, I can't come up here and tell you guys that you never believe everything I say. Um, cool, but you know, that's not how that works. Um, and specifically, like, I know when you're reading, like, articles and things online, you immediately go, yeah, I totally believe that. Whatever said this clickbait article says, I totally believe what's in there. Or do you guys at least, you know, have to read the article or the comments, or if you go deep dive, like where they reference everything, which is what Ethan does. Because he's a nerd. He's not here to defend himself anymore. Um, most of us need to have some sort of evidence to believe in whatever is being told to us. Um, so we are talking about Jesus. We're talking about proving Jesus. Um, when Christ walked this earth, um, the church leaders and crowds he was speaking to, they needed proof. They constantly asked him for this proof, like, prove yourself to us. And Christ was like, cool, I'm going to do that. Then. Christ gave the proof that he was God, or that he is God. Throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, we have the evidence of who he is. In the Old Testament, God revealed himself to his people in real and concrete ways, called theophanies. Um, the word theophany uh, means a revelation or vis visible visible appearance of God to man. Words are hard, guys. Um, so yeah, it's just God revealing himself completely visibly to us. And an example of a theophany is when God revealed himself to Moses on Mount Sinai before he gave the Ten Commandments. And this is from Exodus. Um, on the morning of the third day, there were pleas of thunder and lightning and heavy cloud over the mountain, and a very loud blast of the shofar, which is a horn that is made out of a horn, like a ram's horn. Fun facts. Uh, so that all the people in the camp trembled. But Moses led the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stationed themselves at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke, because the Lord had come down upon it in fire. The smoke rose from it as though from, from a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled violently. The blast of the shofar grew louder and louder, while Moses was speaking, and God was answering him with thunder. Great. Very loud. Very real, visible, that God is, like, wants our attention. And then in the New Testament, he, we have revelations of God, like through the transfiguration of Jesus. After you guys do. Um, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a mountain by themselves. <clears throat> and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, conversing with them. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. And then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell prostrate and were very much afraid. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, and do not be afraid. And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Christ. These two events reflect back on each other. Because 
The Jews of the time that he, the Christ would have been speaking to, would have heard the story of the transfiguration and then remembered the scripture of Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. And there are many examples of these theophanies throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, which provide evidence that Christ is God. In the same example, like I said, the Ten Commandments, of right before receiving the Ten Commandments, we see God through the control of wind and thunder. Um, the corresponding event within the New Testament would be when Christ controlled the winds and the storm of the sea. Um, the scriptures that make the, of the Old Testament would have been very well known to basically everyone, um, even some of the Gentiles um, that would have been living outside of the Jewish communities. Um, Christ is talking to these people and using the stories and then showing within himself these things that reflect back to these scriptures, these stories that they've been hearing their entire life of who God is. And then another way that Christ is proving himself along with these theophanies is through his miracles. Now, what's a miracle? It's simply put, a sign or wonder, such as healing or control of nature, which can only be attributed to divine power. Throughout the New Testament, we read of Christ's miracles, from healing lepers to the hemorrhaging woman to healing the blind man to his ultimate miracles of you know, literally raising multiple people from the dead. Um, these are unimaginable signs of God's power and pure evidence of who Christ is as a God. Because only God can control those things. However, miracles are not magic tricks. They're manifestations of God meant for our good and our satisfaction. This is why not every request for a miracle is fulfilled in the way that the one requesting it may want it. They're not instant gratification. They're not handed out like lollipops, you know, when you leave in the dentist or the doctor's office and you get a sticker. Like, that's not how God hands out miracles. Um, even though we may pray for them or for ourselves or someone else and it may relieve an immense amount of suffering, it may not mean that that suffering ends. But it doesn't mean that those prayers aren't answered. They just may not be answered in the way that you were hoping for, or the person was hoping for. We suffered. We had a whole retreat out of it. <laughs> um, at varying times in our lives so that we can grow in our relationship with Christ, with God himself. During these times, we are called to look to the cross and see how he suffered to give us the, the miracle of eternal life with him in heaven. Because the resurrection of Christ is the ultimate proof of who he is. He said that he was going to die, and then he said he was going to raise from the dead, and then he did it. And then continued to work. Like, he's been through a lot, and then continued to be like, hey, disciples, you're not doing right now. Here's all the things you need to do. Like, we just read through Acts where they're like, all right, Jesus is still around. Jesus is still teaching us things. We got stuff to do. Like, he's all the way here through Pentecost. It's like, there's a lot, he's got some work to do. After he, like, died, like, took a severe beating, was betrayed by his BFF, and, you know, died, and then rose again, like, I feel like at that point, you need a break. I would have forever. But no, he keeps working. He's got things to do, because he's got to prepare his disciples to make us into intentional disciples. And this whole Life Night series is about who Christ is. Last week, Andrew talked about, um, you know, very different images of Christ that we see and how that those representations of who Christ is in many aspects of this much bigger person. Um, and we have the number one best-selling book of evidence called the Bible uh, to look through all of these scriptures and things like that, but I'm not a huge fan of just Bible bingling my way through scripture. Um, Scripture's hard for me, and it's something that I take really a lot of time with. So, just plopping down and like reading the Bible, it's just something very daunting to me. Um, but honestly, the proof that really affected my life and why I'm standing in front of all of you uh, is because I encountered Christ. Because we have that ability to encounter Him literally every day. Um, and 
it doesn't have to be super flashy. The first time, other than, like, we all know, we go to the sacraments, we had first communions at church today, like, we all saw the little ones receiving communion, and it was beautiful. That's when we, like, literally had communion for the first time. But none of us were really thinking about all of that. It's super deep. Um, and even if we made it through our confirmation, we're not all super deep thinking about how the Holy Spirit is, like, through us now. Um, sometimes it takes us a couple of different experiences with Christ. And my first, like, real tangible experience with him was on a mission trip. And it wasn't flashy. It wasn't like I was all of a sudden, like, speaking in tongues or, like, Ethan talked about a couple of months ago. Um, like, uncontrollable laughter through adoration or watching people, like, be slain in the spirit. Like, that was not what happened to me. I just really enjoyed working for the residents that I worked with. There were these older couples, um, there were three different houses, and I saw Christ in their faces when they had their room painted, or we cleaned their yard after climbing a very, very big hill to be in Pittsburgh, and they dropped us to the bottom of the hill. And she was so excited to see us as we slowly trudged our way with all our tools up the top of the house. And that excitement was enough. Like, that was where I saw Christ and I was in these people's faces. It was in my peers' faces as they prayed so earnestly. It was in the talks that I heard, yes, but mostly it was just in this real sense of happiness that I literally never felt before. And it's all because, like, I felt this call that Christ was, like, literally with me in it. It was the reason why everything was happening. <laughs> and I've been chasing and working on that feeling for the last 20 years. <laughs> because that was how important it was. My relationship with Christ, though rocky at times, is my most important relationship because he proved to me how important he is to me. Because his love and his sacrifice that he made for each and every one of us, and specifically for me, is all the proof I'm ever going to need. Hey, love.